think five minutes for uh, questions. Any questions, comments? Okay, well done. Here. Well, thank you for this exceptionally clear and, and, and transparent and very friendly uh, summary of uh, what uh, really we had in terms of uh, commonalities and disagreements over the last decade. On this, to you, surprising uh, move, uh, at least in the last edition, away from probabilistic uh, to uh, multidimensional population projections, maybe just a piece of background that at YASA, which is clearly one of the world's leading uh, environmental change uh, modeling uh, groups, so several, several teams are there, we had constant uh, discussions. Um, about the, the scenario versus the probabilistic. And there are some of my, actually most of the other Yasa colleagues uh, think that it is not appropriate to do probabilistic modeling because of what they call deep uncertainty. So we had, uh, what is deep uncertainty? Deep uncertainty is also model uncertainty. Uh, and the sort of the other uncertainty that you can deal with in a probabilistic sense is what we call parameter uncertainty. So you know the model. <coughs> and you are just uncertain about what the specific parameters are and for those parameters uh, you can uh, assume some uncertainty ranges. And uh, in a way, the, uh, my argument was almost that the core component model, we know for sure that we don't have model uncertainty in the market field. Uh, well, this was, uh, I mean, this strong belief in the core component method uh, was weakened a bit by uh, from our other work on, on multi-dimensional, because the core component model is only two-dimensional. You assume that every person, in a, all the people in a given age and sex group are homogeneous. But of course they are not. And the question is how uh, this heterogeneity affects the dynamics of the behavior. And that was the, much of the early work by Chip Pell and Anatoly Yashin. They showed them what's called the deviate dynamics of heterogeneous systems. And we are not capturing this heterogeneity in uh, the, the standard cohort component model. And of course, many of the, the sensitivity analysis of the different education-specific work has very clearly demonstrated that uh, the education, if you incorporate explicitly the education I mentioned, the results are different. It can be quite different. And also, if you do sort of a, on a national level, like you do a population projection for India as a country, or you do it for the different uh, states of India, uh, with identical assumptions that keep everything constant, the outcome is very different because you have a self-free weighting of the provinces. So there's all these sources of heterogeneity, be it spatial or social or whatever, have a big influence. And then I was also sensitized to the fact about the um, uncertain starting values in many countries. Yeah. Even in China, I mean, the UN assumes 1.6, the TFR, the latest census of China said 1.05. Nobody knows how much of an undercount this is. And China is the biggest country in the world. And, and so the assumption where it will ultimately go, we just don't know. So I'm more appreciative now of the deep uncertainties that we even have in, in population. Uh, having said this, I, my sort of secret agenda to go is exactly in the way for the coming years that you say that we really uh, should not give up the uh, doubtless advantages of uh, probabilistic population projections. There is additional information, I still uh, believe it, uh, but we should be a bit more careful and sensitive to the, uh, the model assumptions that we make. And, uh, uh, finding probabilistic ways in incorporating model uncertainty and also empirical data uncertainty and other things that are usually taken for granted. But thanks again. Thank you. Agree. I agree. I have two issues. Uh, first, uh, in the early days of probabilistic uh, forecasts, there was a discussion between Wolfgang and you are Alho and Ron Lee, particularly on the problem of expert opinions versus time series analysis approach. Uh, it would be nice to hear, for me as layman in this field, uh, what is the state of the art now? Is this now being decided? Is the expert method generally uh, accepted? Or what about this uh, time series analysis and so on? And the second question, which is somewhat maybe related, uh, in all these discussions, the words or the concept of confidence interval uh, with respect to these various trajectories in the future is not used anymore. And I remember to these early days of the discussion, 
were particularly of Ayuha Alho mentioned, this is not a real a confidence interval in the sense of mathematical statistics, rather than something else. No. 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 Okay. The uh, easy question first, the last one. Confidence or prediction? I, I prefer to talk about prediction intervals. Uh, keeping confidence intervals to statistical estimation, estimation of unknown parameters and the uncertainty around uh, the, the estimate. Um, I, I think it's, it, clarify, it, it is much clearer for any uninformed uh, uh, user of the, of, or, uh, of the projections that we are talking about a, an event that may or may not happen in the future when we use the term prediction interval. Not confidence, but prediction. Now, this is a very much a frequentist approach, because in the Bayesian approach, we would even not call it prediction intervals. Um, expert versus uh, time series, there has been some discussion, that's right. In practice, uh, the last 10 or 15 years, we use elements of all methods. I mean, when, when we would confine ourselves to a sheer time series approach, which is naive, which is not correct, then also we use some expert knowledge. What is the best part of the data series that you can, that you can use? Which data do you not trust and do you throw, throw out? In my view, expert opinion or time series, it's not an either or, but we combine the strength of, of the two. Um, and then also a, a third element uh, to include knowledge from historical population projection areas. <coughs> and all three of them are combined when we nowadays when we prepare when we compute a probabilistic projection. Uh, thank you. Any other urgent questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, th thanks for a fascinating uh, uh, survey of, of, of a field uh, I've watched very interesting uh, interesting uh, from the sidelines. Uh, could I just take up your um, Examples at the beginning, and you talked about uh, um, the Norwegian government demanding from Lockheed um, a uh, confidence interval around their um, uh, price for the super jets that they wanted. Um, you didn't quote a lower a bound. Um, does that indicate that there is that, uh, that in fact, uh, I would have said from my reading of uh, the press and media that uh, the, uh, the likelihood is always going to be higher than the manufacturer <laughs> first, <laughs> first uh, proposal. The like, I didn't understand the likelihood that... The, 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 the price that the manufacturer quotes initially to, to a government in most cases seems to be a, a radical underestimate. So, so, that, so you know, could you comment on that question then? Um, what about how do the Norwegian government then, let's say, face with, with a realistic probabilistic distribution? Um, uh, how does that affect their decision making? And do they have to take into account op op opportunity costs of cancellation versus acceptance of a contract, things like that? Uh, uh, and the consequences for the integrity of the Norwegian state if they don't have those jets flying around? Uh, um, uh, and then, how do they quality assure um, the probabilistic calculations? Uh, now, in uh, academic discourse, you know, we're, we're forced forced to reveal all our secrets, you know, all our assumptions, and they can be uh, challenged and tested and debated as we're doing in, in this conference. But what about commercial firms? Do they allow that? Thank you, uh, Phil. Yeah, pertinent questions, and I would not claim that I have the, uh, the, the final answer to, to all of these. These numbers that you see here are estimates of about four or five years ago, and then inflated to current uh, Norwegian no, prices in Norwegian uh, crowns. In practice, these are revised every third or fourth year. I haven't seen the most recent estimates uh, still, but of course, if you would ask Lockheed nowadays to come up with similar prediction, then the numbers would be different. Um, then there is a cost, of course. Should, should we, based on, sorry, 
based on these numbers, the contract was, uh, was signed. Now you can always cancel the contract, but then there are, of course, opportunity costs that will be <coughs> not, uh, not very cheap. Um, you, uh, um, you asked about how realistic are these uh, assets. I'm not sure that I can, again, can give the other answer. This is not being discussed in, uh, in Norwegian uh, newspapers. The reason why I gave you this example is the way of thinking. You improve decision-making when you think in terms of a problem distribution. Of course, zero as the lower limit is not very realistic. But they wanted to have a forecast that with 50% chance would be kept or not. And then in addition, a forecast that would be kept. So, price would be lower. This is an upper bound. If it turns out that the real price will be 50 billion in likely, then the Norwegian government has saved money. Fine, excellent. We made a reservation in the budget, but then we, fortunately enough, we have a uh, 